What we wanted to do today was share some of the research uh, that we've been doing uh, on editor trends. And um, I guess the first question is why have we been researching editor, editor trends at the foundation? Um, okay, he needs me to move over behind here. Um, and you know, it's a, it's a good question. I'm hoping it's a question that was largely answered this morning um, in Sue's presentation and in the board co conversation. And if it wasn't answered this morning, hopefully it was answered back in March when um, Sue shared a note to the community uh, about the editor trends work and the issues and the challenges we have uh, with the trends in editing. But um, suffice it to say that we're really focused on this issue. And we really want to do it in a, f in a way where we're base basing our understanding of the problem and also our understanding of potential solutions on, on facts as much as we can. Um, and I'll say about a year ago when we were really thinking early about the, 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 these issues, all we had really were anecdotes and stories. And we had no way really of knowing whether the anecdotes or stories were the typical, the typical thing going on or the exceptional story that was you know, not typical of what was going on. And so we've started uh, t really to focus on how do, we, how do we really understand what's going on in our projects? Uh, how do we really understand what um, the trends look like? Um, how do we really understand who, who our editors are? And um, you know, all with the, with the goal of getting clar enough clarity that we can then, as a movement, start to solve problems that we, that we have. Um, in a constructive fashion, and then obviously re research those solutions as well to see if they're actually making a difference. So it's a really, really important um, area of work, and we actually think it's a really important role that the foundation can play, which is to put resources against research so that we all have a clear picture of what we're up against and what, uh, what, uh, what works and what doesn't work. So these are some of the reasons why, we, which, which we laid out there, but I think it largely uh, talks about we want to understand the overall health of our community. Um, we don't really know our, the overall health of the community. We never really ask the community, how, how well are you doing? How satisfied are you? Uh, is this, is this the, exp the experience that you continue to look for? Um, what are the challenges that you're facing? Um, we want to understand what's driving positive and negative trends in the projects. Uh, we want to understand what features could encourage participation and understand that quantitatively as well as qualitatively. Um, we want to understand you know, different community efforts that can encourage greater participation, greater, um, you know, greater retention of newbies, and, and actually obviously finding more people to do all the hard work that you all do day in and day out uh, in a supportive fashion. And of course, we want the projects to grow. And I would say I'm personally, I uh, lead our work focused on global development. And I have to say that it's a, you know, it's the only way we'll ever be successful is if we grow the projects. We need to grow Hindi Wikipedia, Hindi Wikipedia, Hindi, Hindi spoken by over 400 million people. We have 60,000 articles in Hindi Wikipedia, many of which are basically stubs. Uh, I was just in Abu Dhabi talking about Arabic Wikipedia. Arabic Wikipedia has 600 active contributors um, 150,000 articles, 350 million speakers. So you know we really need to grow our projects because there are you know there are billions of people out there who we do not actually you know capture the knowledge that is accessible to them. So I just wanted to sort of share that as kind of the reason why it's super important to me that we have healthy communities and that we have growing communities. So I'm going to turn it over to Howie who's going to talk. Right, you next. Okay, got a little bit of a dance going on up here. Um, he's going to talk about the editor trends work that he and uh, uh, De Diedrich did. All right, my name is Howie. Um, in case you guys don't know me, I'm a product manager with the foundation. So, can you guys hear me now? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so, what I do is I spend uh, part of my time working with the developer team, people like Brandon, on feature stuff like article feedback and wiki love. Um, but I also spend uh, probably about half of my time just staring at numbers. So that's what we're going to talk about today, is the numbers I stare at. So the first one is uh, something that uh, Graph I want to show is what Sue started talking about. And this is the active editors for all Wikipedia projects uh, since uh, 2000, 
uh, one, so since the uh, beginning of the projects. And I'm not sure how many of you guys have actually seen this chart before, but this is the one chart that shows the tremendous growth of the projects between around 2003, 4, 5, 6, all the way up to 2007, a peak in two th early 2007, a plateau, and then a slight decline. Um, and this is when we talk about the editor decline, this is the main chart that we're looking at. This tracks all active editors for all Wikipedia projects. And the definition we use for an active editor is if you make over five edits within one month, you are considered an active editor of the Wikipedia project. Now this is the picture overall, um, but what we find is substantially the same pattern when you look at all the mature Wikipedia projects. So if you take a look at the German Wikipedia, the Spanish Wikipedia, uh, the Japanese Wikipedia, they essentially follow the same trend of a very huge ramp up followed by a peak and then a slight decline. The exact time of the peak will vary, but it essentially follows the similar pattern. And what I wanna do over the next uh, couple slides is to basically unpack the drivers of this trend. And the way we look at this is a basic flow mechanism. Like anybody who studied fluid mechanics or even accounting will be familiar with this way of looking at things. And it's basically to say the number of active editors you have in any given period is a function of the people that come in and the people that leave. And it's really kind of that simple model that we're using uh, to look at th this issue. Now, with regard to the number of people that are coming in, this is a chart that you guys might not have seen. And this is all actually available on um, Eric Zakta's uh, stats.wikimedia.org. So I, actually, I would encourage you guys to take a look at the, uh, the, the detailed numbers behind it on, the, on that site. But what this shows is the total number of new Wikipedians that are coming into all of our Wikipedia projects in a given month. Now, the technical definition is if you make over 10 cumulative lifetime edits, then you're considered a new Wikimedian. And it's our measure of the number of new editors that are joining the project in a given month. And you see it, is, if it follows a very similar pattern, right? There's a huge ramp up up to 2007. It peaks, but then what you notice is if you compare this to the active editors uh, graph, what happens is it actually falls quite a bit more rapidly. If you take a look at the numbers the behind this, the active editors are falling at about 5% year over year. So if we compare June of this year to June of last year, the difference is about minus 5%. The active editor number is, is actually minus 10%. So in terms of velocity, this number is falling quite a bit more rapidly than the total, total level of the active editors, um, which is a concerning trend because this represents the supply of quote unquote fresh blood into the system. And this is something that we're gonna have to really pay attention to because you know, this is basically, you know, when, when I talk to uh, longtime Wikipedians about the, uh, the number of editors coming in that'll uh, take the place of existing editors and help with uh, stuff like vandalism patrol, page patrol, um, article, uh, new, ar new page patrol, the, this is the supply of editors that we're talking about. Now, the editor trend study looks at the second piece, and this is what uh, Diedrich and I collaborated for several months last year on, is to figure out, okay, we know that the number of people that are joining the, the, pro the projects is falling. Then let's take a look at the second component of the flow. What about the people that are currently part of the projects? How are they actually flowing through the system, so to speak? And what we find is this pattern, and I apologize, it's a little small. What this is is a cohort analysis of the people that join the project in a given month how their activity changes over time. So if you take a look at this graph, what it shows you is the percent of people in a given month after they joined that are still active. So what we see is in 2000, the green line is 2006. After one month, approximately half-ish of the people are still editing Wikipedia. Now when you take a look at this graph, what you notice is there's a very, very obvious clustering. Right? What happens is the the people that joined before 2006 are retained at one rate, and the people that joined after 2006 are retained at another rate. And the difference is about half, right? We find that the people that joined before 2006, after a year, between 30 and 40% of those users are still actively editing Wikipedia. But those who joined after 2007, only about 10% are active after one year. So it's a dramatic 
dramatic decrease in the number or the percentage of users that are retained after a year. And there are a bunch of theories that, um, that we've discussed that may be giving rise to this phenomenon. The predominant one is during the time of the massive increase of editors into the system, the communities put up a bunch of defense mechanisms to, mechanisms to basically protect the encyclopedia. That's when a lot of the uh, policies around, for example, biographies of living persons um, came into play. And these are all designed to protect the encyclopedia from this onslaught of users. And what happened is after that, these policies persisted, right? And they persisted, and the way we see them in the numbers is that what we have is a lower retention rate that, that happens until today. The second thing that's interesting about this graph is if you actually take a look at the tail end, right? And the tail end represents the behavior of these cohorts in the past 12 months. What we find is that if you've stayed with us for so long, you're probably gonna stay going forward. So the issue is not with retaining existing editors because those editors are staying at a relatively reasonable rate. If you take a look at the numbers, there's about a 20% attrition from year to year of the existing editors. Um, so the issue isn't there. We're retaining experienced editors at a reasonable rate. The issue is the new editors that are coming in are being shoved out of the system very, very quickly. And what we find is this basic trend, again, holds for most mature Wikipedias. So the graph that you see here is essentially the same for the German Wikipedia, the Spanish Wikipedia, the French Wikipedia, as it is for the English Wikipedia. Now, one thing that this is actually not part of the other trend study that I wanted to bring up is that when you take a look at the people that are joining Wikipedia, what we're finding is a decline across all kind of all bands of users. So people that edit just a little bit are declining as well as people that are editing a lot. And what these two graphs show are for people that join in say 2006, how many end up making 10,000 edits in the following year, right? So people that join in 2006, we have a total of 244 users that end up making 10,000 edits in the following year, which is a really high level activity. But the number that end up reaching that, that level in 2009 goes down to 56. So we're not only seeing a decline in the total number of people that are joining, but the ones that are joining, fewer of them are actually making it into the very, very high levels of editing that we've seen in the past. So the last thing I want to talk about is um, what I'm calling the uh, gap between the readership and the editorship. And there are many ways that you can get at this number. Because if you take a look at the very broad trend, what we find is that the number of readers keeps on growing. We crossed 400 million in the past year. That number keeps on growing while the editorship is declining. right? And I wanted to put a little more kind of context behind this. So what this graph shows is the total number of daily registrations within Wikipedia as a proxy for the readership. We know from other analysis that only about 30% of people that register end up editing. So about 70% of all registers are, uh, registrations are essentially readers. Now, if you take a look at this graph, it's unclear which direction this is headed, right? So if you take a look at 2006, there's a clear increase to 2007, but then afterwards it kind of goes up and down, and there's actually quite a bit of seasonality that goes with our registration. But it's not a, a clear trend either way. But if you take a look at the percentage of registrations that make at least one edit, the trend becomes very clear. So what we find here is that of the people that register, those that actually attempt to make and complete an edit is going down. And there are many different ways to interpret that. One way to interpret this could be, well, maybe the interest in editing Wikipedia is declining. So fewer people proportionately are starting to edit. Or you can interpret this as, you know, there's an increase, like, increasing gap between what people expect to see when they click on the edit button and what they end up seeing, right? So the wiki text over time has become more and more of a disconnect for our users. Now, this last slide is, is kind of for fun. Um, and conceptually, the way I kind of look at uh, the 
uh, the editor trends is uh, one way to look at it is in terms of supply and demand. But I always ask, okay, what's happening with the supply of kind of like nerdy people that want to write encyclopedia articles and how does that compare to the actual trends that we're seeing? And I've gone like back and forth on how to actually quantify nerdy people because um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty hard thing to do. And I settled on this one measurement. It's imperfect, but again, this is, this is more, mostly for fun. This red line shows the number of students in that have uh, achieved 700 plus on their math uh, portions of their SAT. And the SAT, the SAT is the college entrance exam um, in the US. So if you apply for college in the US, you have to take this entrance exam. And what a 700, it's, it's scaled um, from 200 to 800. And what a 700 represents is, I think it's like the top 90 or 95th percentile of scores. So it's basically people that go to, say, like, you know, MIT or Caltech, you know, people that, I would think would be nice Wikipedia authors. Well, what you find is that if you chart this number, this number goes up for the simple reason that populations are growing. And because populations are growing, you're going to have more and more smart people. And if you take a look at the numbers, the number of people that achieve the score on the math portion of their SAT goes up by about 2% per year. Right? And if you superimpose this on the active, num active editors trend, Conceptually, what you find is, again, an increasing gap between smart people and people that are editing Wikipedia. The people that are editing Wikipedia is going down, and the quote-unquote supply of smart people who are capable of editing Wikipedia is going up. So again, there's this increasing gap between what, what, I'm, what I'm looking at as the supply of people who can do the work and the people that end up doing the work. So that's the end of the editor trend stuff. Um, I think Barry, you were, were you going to talk about the uh, the yeah. survey? Yeah. Thanks, Howie. So um, in April, um, our team, actually led by Mani Pandey, who's not here, so I'm pretending to be Mani at the moment, um, which is a little difficult because she's a, 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 a bit of a shorter um, Indian woman, so I don't exactly look much like her. But um, importantly, we decided. Um, as, as soon as we, um, <coughs> excuse me, as soon as I joined, uh, felt that, we, and, and as we were developing the strategic plan, we decided we really needed to do a better job of hearing from, uh, hearing what's going on in the editor community. And so Mani launched uh, our first actually internal survey of editors. And actually it was really the first effort uh, in a systematic way to actually e uh, survey editors specifically. There was a survey done by Uni, Uni Merit um, about two to three years ago, which was attempted to, to survey editors, but actually was open to anybody. So a lot of people who actually filled out the Uni Merit survey were readers, not editors. And so this, this survey was designed specifically to get at you, you know, actually people who actually are editing Wikipedia and, and have been doing so for a long time. Um, the survey is actually the beginning of something we plan on doing twice a year. So hopefully we'll make it not so painful, uh, but I think it's it's really important work for us because I think it'll give us as a community a sense of of the temperature of our community, who's there, what are they thinking, how are they, how are they experiencing things, and and by doing it twice a year we'll be able to see trends over time. So what I'm going to show you are actually a few snapshots because of course we've only done the survey once, but hopefully next year we'll have you know two more data points. Oh sorry, if we go back I just wanted to. Explain briefly introduction to the survey. We had 5,000 people complete the survey in a community of about 85,000. That's an extremely high sample size. So we're really happy about the sample that we got. Thank you to all of you who completed it. 31,000 people actually saw the banner. Uh, so we, you know, we got a pretty good share of you actually filling it out. Uh, thanks to the great work of our volunteer translators, we actually deployed the survey in 22 languages. Uh, it was a bit, of, a bit of a technical feat to actually make it work in 22 languages, but it was fantastic that you know many people would have the opportunity to fill the survey in their native language. Um, and as I said, it was conducted in April. It was available to registered users of Wikipedia only, and each person only saw it once. The reason we wanted to do that is we didn't want people who were spending a lot of time on Wikipedia seeing it a lot, and therefore being more likely to uh, do the survey than somebody who maybe shows up one, once a week or so. So we were trying to get eliminate bias as much as possible. So here's some snippets 
Um, I will say before, I'm going to go through a couple things. Monty has been writing weekly blogs for the last about nine weeks um, on the Wikimedia Foundation blog. So those of you who really want to start digging into it, have a look at the blogs. And also, there's going to be we're going to be putting the data out in an anonymized fashion. So all of you who have statistical capabilities and want to kind of play with the data, uh, would love for you to go to town on it. But here's some of the, the really basic things. The first thing was um, reminding us of our challenge with gender. Um, this survey actually showed a, a worse picture in terms of female participation um, than we had even thought of from, from previous surveys. So we only got about 8.8% of the folks that filled out the survey were women, uh, predominantly male. Um, not, not terribly surprising, but a worse base case than we thought. And you know, really increases the importance of us making progress on this issue. 20% um, are married, 24% of, of uh, children. I don't know whether it's only, I think that's you know, just interesting, just ge general pictures of who, who, who you all are. Not surprisingly, majority have college degree and above. Um, interestingly, we still we have a significant group of, uh, you know, of high school students who are uh, active editors. I'm sure some of you may be here. Uh, I've certainly met some on, on my travel. Lots of folks who are probably still in, in, in university uh, or in studies. And then obviously a lot of folks who have uh, completed their studies or, or, or you know, or have completed um, graduate degrees. Um, this was something that was interesting, you know, is that majority of uh, Wikipedia's are, are employed. 52% um, are working full-time or part-time. It's interesting, there was a mo model that a lot of people talked about, about the Wikipedian is a 25-year-old white male graduate student. And I think what the survey will start to do, and I think Mani's going to talk about this more in her upcoming blogs, is it actually breaks our community apart more clearly. We're not all that way. Uh, we're not all 25 years old. We're not all white males. Uh, we're not all students. And so it's really important that we see that there's a lot more diversity actually within the within the editing community. You obviously all know that. But it's important as we think about who we are and what kind of challenges people have or what kind of motivations they have. There's more diversity in the, in there than we than 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 is often talked about in the way that we get caricatured. And, and this is another example. You know, our community is not as young as you know, a lot of people think. Um, and, you know, the average age is 31, medium's t median's 28. And there are a lot of folks who are, you know, more in my demographic than, you know, in other demographics, you know, up on the, up on the older end of the spectrum here. And I think that's really important for the health of our projects that we, that we you know, value and, and uh, continue to increase this, the spread of age, gender, you know, background um, uh, in our work. Wow, nice transition. Uh, um, our editors are still largely, you know, U.S. and Europe, uh, U.S. and Europe based. Um, not that surprising. Important that we transition that. We did get pretty good data sets. I'm going to start to share some data on Brazil and India. We got over 100 replies in each of those places, so we can look at some of the data around, you know, other geographies as well and see the dynamics of the community there. Yeah. Oh. That's a really great point. The survey was not completed in Japan. It has now been completed in Japan. So we actually just should have just, just this week or last week would have finished the survey in Japan. Yeah, that's right. And Japan would probably be in, uh, pretty significant in those numbers as well. So it's a fantastic point. Thank you for mentioning that. Another thing, not everybody is a programmer. <laughs> not everybody is an open source hacker. Right? I mean, there's a lot and a really great core of people who are open source hackers. But actually, most people are kind of like mo most people online. We probably overrepresent, clearly overrepresent people who are able to program or create their own applications. But most of our community pretty much does what a lot of people do online. They download, they set up things. And that's again important that we can't continually design for you know, an extremely tech savvy person. Uh, we need to think about the, the spectrum. Um, important on behaviors, um, people like positive feedback. Um, Again, not hugely surprising, but if you look at the interactions, positive versus negative, that people have, we spend a lot less time giving other people positive feedback. And that's a little bit of the motivation uh, uh, behind Wikilove, is let's make it easy to actually say nice things to pe people. Let's uh, show, them, show them appreciation. And really, you all love it, and, and all the editors love it. People love to have a, compl you know, if a compliment on your article 
or an edit. Um, having your article selected as a feature article. Article making it to the front page. These are really high in terms of you know people really, really valuing it. And I think we ask people, when you have that interaction, does it make you more likely to edit more? And they say, yes, it really does matter. So really important that we have positive feedback flowing through our community, that we take a little moment to, to say, nice piece of work. You know, that was an amazing contribution. Uh, that makes a difference. And um, negative contributions, negative comments do not work. Um, not surprising. People don't like, and it, you know, don't like being told negative things, having negative interactions. And frankly, they're not as thick-skinned as we may make it out to be. It's not that people just say, oh, well, that somebody made a negative comment, that doesn't matter to me. The act, people actually said, if somebody does something negative, that affects my propensity to edit more and contribute more. And so we have to be careful in how we dole out negative, uh, negative commentary and feedback. You know, being looked down on by more experienced editors, having your edit reverted without any explanation. The, the actual survey showed people don't mind having their edit reverted. It's just how they get their edit reverted. If it's reverted and there's positive, there's constructive comments on why it was reverted and ways you can improve, it has no negative effect on people's propensity to edit. Revert it, don't explain, 60% you know, reduction in their, in their, in their interest in, in doing that. Um, so it's really important, not surprising, but just underscores the real importance of us thinking about the human interactions, as Ting said this morning, and how we all like to be positively, positively motivated. And we all find it really d difficult when we, we get a negative interaction. And actually, the actual experience is really a mix. The people don't, you know, we're not overwhelmingly positive with people. We're not overwhelmingly negative with people. It's kind of a mix. But I think our challenge over the next, you know, series of six months is to see the positive experiences starting to outweigh the negative experiences. Because that's how we really, you know, people will continue to, to, to stay engaged. And, and get more deeply engaged. I think that's it, right? Oh, okay. I already explained this one. Sorry. Uh, this is this is the picture about the reverts don't hurt as much as if they're don't don't hurt as much if they are explained. Cool. So I'm going to turn it over to Stephen. Talk about Wikimedia Summer of Research. So right now, the sorry, yeah, the right now, uh, what is available is there are a series of blog posts on Wikimedia Foundation's blog, uh, which talk about a lot of this data. There is also all the top line results from the survey have been published. They're also available. Uh, it, it's referred to in a blog, and I think it's posted on Wikimedia Commons. Um, and then in the in the coming weeks, the raw data, anonymized, will be published for folks to work with. Um, as well as we'll continue to have more uh, more blog posts come out of this stuff. Oh, and Eric just put a link up on Twitter, so all set. Oh, he will. Hi. Uh, so I'm Stephen, and I'm a fellow in the community department at the Wikimedia Foundation, but I actually come from Ian Wiki and Commons. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about a project that's actually still underway at the Wikimedia Foundation, which I'm working with uh, Diederik again. Van Leer on, um, as well as eight researchers from five or six countries, mostly PhD candidates, to sort of um, dig a little deeper into the why of we may be having an effect on these general editor trends in terms of the internal community dynamics, um, like which aspects of community participation, especially where new editors are interacting with experienced editors, what's causing them to go away, what, what policies or practices are having the biggest effect on them. Um, so like I said, we're still underway. It's three months. Um, but this is some of the sort of like breaking uh, research that came out uh, that we did in July. Um, and there'll obviously be more coming along in August and September. Um, the first one I wanted to point out, which is unfortunately the, the graph's actually really huge, so there's no scale right here, but so I wanted to start in 2007 um, and just say this is actually beyond edit count. This is actually bytes added um, by each cohort, and each cohort is a uh, color with a gradient. So you can see sort of each cohort, each group of people who joined in a year, joining and adding contributions to the encyclopedia. and. The takeaway here for me that's interesting is that this goes up until 2010. We didn't show 2011 because there's incomplete data for the year. Um, 
but that by the end of 2010, people who joined in 2009 and 2010 were contributing almost 50% of the bytes to the main space in English Wikipedia. Like that's huge to me that new Wikipedians really are making a contribution that's valuable and sticks, sticks around because this doesn't include deleted revisions. Um, the next one, which is, is just a small tidbit, but we, we charted in the main namespace the lag between the time it takes someone to register and the time that they edit. Um, and 70%, a little bit more actually, of people who sh ever show up and make an edit do, within, do it within the first hour of when they show up. So like when someone shows up and you either revert them or get, leave them a message of any kind or interact with them in any way that they actually see, that makes a really big difference on whether they stick around or not. Um, and then the last one is, a, that's actually a joke, snuggle, don't huggle, but this is, it's a little bit complicated to see, but this is, this is a chart of, um, of all of the newbies who get a first message and edit, what their first message to them was and by what tool. Um, and so we have, you know, bots, one bot called Cluebot, um, Huggle, Twinkle, the different kinds of that, Friendly, which was eventually merged into Twinkle, that kind of thing. But the takeaway here is that more than 70% of new English Wikipedians who edit get their first message from either Cluebot, which is an anti-vandal bot, Huggle, or Twinkle. And most of those are warnings overall. So, um, Uh, yeah, so Twinkle and Huggle, and some, uh, I think, I'm not sure about Twinkle itself, but I know Huggle is localized in a couple languages. They're, they're semi-automated editing tools. So someone either downloads an application or has a script, and what they do is instead of reverting an edit, entering an edit summary, saving, and then going to someone's talk page and leaving them a message, they click one button, it reverts the edit, automatically sends someone a templated warning that says, please don't do that again, or whatever, depending on the level. Um, Oh, and I guess I should say, we started with English Wikipedia because it's the biggest data set, and once we get the statistics and tools down um, for working with that, um, and we'll, those are freely shared once they're done, um, then we'll be able to move on to the other Wikipedias, which are must, much faster to move through with these queries. Um, but to sort of touch on the point a little more, we can delve into the graph a little bit more if you want, if you're curious. Um, it's sort of a, a, a trifecta to me that like these new Wikipedians, if they stick around, are making valuable contributions. But when they show up, and it's important what happens early on in their editing history, the vast majority of them aren't actually really getting a message from a human being. Um, and the message that they're, messages that they're getting are these sort of like impersonal, templatized uh, warning messages that don't really tell any of them about what the community is or how they might help or how they might even improve. Um, one of the things that we're doing right now to sort of extend this study is actually an experiment live on English Wikipedia um, to send out a randomized set of different kinds of templates that have different kinds of aspects. Some of them are a little more personalized. They say, hi, this is my username. I'm a volunteer on Wikipedia just like you. I reverted your edit because, and comparing that to either the standard warning, which just says you have been reverted, please do not do that again, or a sort of mix between the two, which says I'm a volunteer, you can become a volunteer too, but in the future, maybe you shouldn't do it this way, that would be helpful, that kind of thing. Um, to see if there's a measurable difference between those different types of communications. Um, and then another one I wanted to, to, to sort of poke at is, this is a, just a sort of different take on um, one of the graphs Howie showed about um, number of editors joining, I'm sorry, we duplicated this one, um, who show up in each of these years, how many of them go on to make X number of edits in their first year. So you can see the peak in number of editors who showed up to and made at least nine edits throughout their lifetime peaked in 2007. But in 2006, a little bit earlier in mid-year, mid um, there was an earlier peak of people who showed up and went on to make 10 to 99 edits, 100 plus, 1,000 plus, 10,000 plus. So it's again that like inability of new Wikipedians who show up to really join the core intense editing community. Um, and then one specific effect of this that I, I think is pretty interesting, this isn't, I don't think this, this graph, the data that we have yet, really proves an absolute causal relationship. But this is um, w editors who are joining wiki projects from 2007 until now. Um, and we measured joining a wiki project um, 
through several methods, whether they used a user box, whether they put themselves in a category, whether they edited a participant's page and added themselves to a list. So it's a correlation of several methods. Um, but there's a, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the, the three different lines, the blue is all Wikipedians joining wiki projects, um, regardless of their age of their account or how much they've edited. So there's a, there's a pretty steep slope if you, if you do a linear trend line um, overall. And then the red line is Wikipedians who've made at least 100 edits or more. And then anyone who's made 100 edits or less is the green line. And it's a little hard to see here, but there's actually a pretty, since, where is it? Since 09, there's actually quite a bit steeper decline in new Wikipedians joining wiki projects than even the general decline in all wiki projects. Um, and there's actually a lot more work that we're still working on um, in the wiki project area in terms of sort of charting which wiki projects are the most active. What, what happens? In terms of, in terms of, the spike, that you've got like oh, the, 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 yeah, no, this, these, these two, these data points are actually single wiki projects that, that had spikes of growth. Um, this one's like, uh, it's wiki project military history. This one's like Turkey. Um, and I forget what these two are, but those are just like single wiki projects which either had like a bot go add members to a category or like they had a, a coordination drive. And they just it there? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because this is a measurement of people who joined wiki projects, not active participants in a wiki project. Um, so those are just some of the tidbits, but um, I wanted to say that the, the sort of next step for these analysis and other ones that we've done over the last couple months and, it and Howie's editor trend stuff is extending it to a lot more communities. Like Portuguese, if, if the Wik Wikimedia Foundation is interested in investing like time and energy in Brazil and the Portuguese Wikipedia community, we have to do all of these same analysis for the Portuguese community and understand it a little bit better. So I think we're gonna do questions if people have comments, questions, that kind of thing. And we can go back and forth in any of the talks or slides or anything if people wanna question anything. Um, Andrew Lee, uh, question for Howie. You the the last slide. I won't question you about the SAT part because I understand that's kind of like uh, just trying to show some uh, external data to try to give some comparison there. But um, I'm trying to think of what other explanations you can find for. I mean, you're analyzing users joining and their behavior, but then it's very hard to quantify kind of like what have the cultural norms in the community been that might provide barriers? Have you, any of you folks, come up with any type of framework or way to kind of measure, you know, as more policies are added, maybe it becomes more hostile? Um, what could you measure in that dimension that would capture that kind of uh, dynamic? Yeah, there, so these, there are a couple of things we could do. Um, I think one of them that's interesting with this thing is that like the two of the questions around the decline thing and the sort of like is it natural question to me are, um, sorry, uh, are, you know, is it a supply issue? Are we just running out of Wikipedians in the world in general? Which I think is the point how he's trying to make here, which is probably not. Um, and then there's also the sort of like uh, opportunity, what can be done in the encyclopedia as far as work side. And we've tried to measure that a little bit in the Wikimedia Summer of Research Project. We've done some um, work studying the ratio of red links to blue links and the number of links in the encyclopedia over time. Um, stuff like, what's, what's one of the more interesting data points? There are like, uh, right, like right now in English Wikipedia, there are at least 150,000 red links with more than 100 incoming red links to them. Um, and the, it's a like power law, like most things and when you count Wikipedia, but it's kind of interesting. Um, the other piece of analysis that I think was really interesting that they did was they analyzed uh, templates that um, experienced users left uh, uh, new users and they classified the templates. I can't remember the exact classifi classification, but they're you know, negative templates and, and positive templates. And what you find is the number of negative templates um, increase, yeah, increases dramatically over time. So I think the next step, which I don't think has been done yet, is to take a look at that type of templating behavior and analyzing the impact on retention. 
Right, that I think would be a, a really interesting piece of analysis to do. Go, go ahead. It's, it's actually a mix. The, all the stuff I showed you now is quant stuff, but we have about 50-50 in terms of computer science and social sciences. Um, so we have someone from uh, rhetoric and composition. We have several ethnographers. Um, I think it's mostly uh, anthropology, ethnography. Um, and we have done some small samples of qualitative coding to just sort of spot check all this stuff. Yeah, please. Um, I just wanted to add one more thing to an answer to Andrew's question, which is that um, in terms of exactly which areas yet, I, we don't know. We're still doing qualitative research into it, but we did the same. Um, uh, <laughs> We did this same analysis, and this is main space only. We did it for the project namespace and project talk in English Wikipedia. And we have to figure out exactly which part of the project namespace it is, because that's really big. It's, it's articles for deletion, it's policy, it's all kinds of things. But when we looked at it, the 2007 cohort from 2007 until now has added like 80 or 90% of the bytes in the project namespace alone like people who joined in 2007. So that's maybe one of the effects in the whole like policy, deletion discussions, ANI kind of crowding areas in the community spaces rather than just article, article talk. So another way of saying that means that the newbies tend to stay in main space and not the... That's what it's pointing to, that they don't, they don't participate in terms of bytes added and text added at all, really. What, what Steven said it seems to indicate that the newbies, as he said, like the 2009, 2010 editors that came, mainly contributed to the main space. They weren't getting involved with the meta stuff or the Wikipedia colon stuff or the policy stuff that's going on, yeah. right? Yeah. Mako? So, yeah. Uh, I mean, this is Yeah, I, I, I've, I've seen your blog post on that, and it, you're right. It's like no matter how you measure it, there is there's this increasing gap between either the readership or you know smart people or however you want to look at it. It's you see the same trend. So. Sebastian, I don't know what they're doing up there, but um, so if one of the the conclusions is that people are running away faster than they used to. Um, have you done any studies on these people, like actually talking to people that have left to find out why it is they have left? There, well, uh, yeah, yeah. But surprisingly, they do. That's actually the the interesting thing about the survey is what we found is that that's what I expected. That you know people that have left would not want to talk to us, but there's this like dual impression of, of Wikipedia. Like the people that have left are generally not very happy with our editor community, but they're still completely enamored of Wikipedia and the mission. So it's it's an interesting kind of dynamic. But the, the high level from the survey we did about a year ago, so we sent um, a survey out to 
uh, casual contributors, so not the very heavy editors that have had lapsed in their editing. And what we found was about half of the reason why they left was some stuff that is completely independent of the community. Like they, they found a job, you know, they got married, they got a girlfriend, boyfriend, um, things that are outside of the community's control. The other half of the reason why they left are things that are part are within the community's control, I would think. So things like um, they had a run-in with an editor that was pushing a point of view. Um, they had uh, they got reverted without explanation. Um, the editing interface was too complicated. The p rules and policies were too difficult to understand. Um, and that that's about half of the reason why these users leave, at least according to the survey that we did. Yeah. Yeah, I actually gave a talk on that last week of Mania. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? I think we still got a couple minutes if and then we can turn it over. I'd actually I actually want kind of want a question for the audience, which is when we've talked about this stuff before, especially editor trends, the theory that usually comes up when people when we when we present the data and people sort of get a grasp on it is that um, like about half of the people who see it immediately come up with the idea that we just don't need new editors anymore like that there's nothing left to be done um, and like I, I had none of the questions seem to suggest that anyone here believes that does anyone really like feel like that's maybe an issue at least in maybe like the larger more mature Wikipedia's that there's just nothing to do anymore Yeah, be bold. Yeah. Okay. Well, I've made that point before when I gave talks at Wikimania in years past, but I, I definitely think the, the um, and, and Jimmy talked about this morning, the, you know, the thrill of creating an article and say, I was the guy who started this article and seeing someone else add to it and then grow, 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 grow. That thrill is completely gone now. In fact, it was gone a few years ago, right? Well, the chances of you starting an article now in Wikipedia is very, very low, right? Right, but they're relatively obscure, right? Yeah, so, they are. right. So I started the articles in 2003 on like about 80% of the temples in Thailand, yeah. right? And I can still go back to them and feel this kind of pride in it, but you can't really do that as a new editor right now, right? You can, in English Wikipedia, right? You can go in there and you can, you can, you can add some little things, you can fact check, you can spell check, but a lot of the times, not only is not obvious to add something, but the people who edited that article for a year or two will rebuff you. You know, we'll say, we've hashed all that out, look at the talk page, go away, yeah. right? So. So, kind of, to play devil's advocate, if you, if you take a look at Eric Zakta Zeitgeist, which um, publishes the top 25 articles that have the most contribution, most contributors in a given month, the, they're almost exclusively current events articles. Right, which is very different than, so if you take a look at the Zeitgeist today, it's very different than it was in 2005, 2006. Like 2005 and 2006, it was like, you know, God, Christianity, you know, quantum physics, stuff like that. Um, but now it seems like the articles that are getting the most amount of, uh, uh, at least contributors, are current events, which would imply that there is some kind of headroom. Shortly. Uh, well, there's a like a revolution since 10 years ago that 10, uh, 10 or 15 years ago, if you sat down and uh, I thought, I wish I, kn I knew something, like anything, like uh, what's the length of the coastline of Fiji? Well, it's been a problem because you couldn't, you, you could go to encyclopedia, but maybe it wasn't there. But today you just Google it and the first result is usually Wikipedia and it's there. So you can in a minute know all, practically everything. It's really rare that you look to something and it's not in Wikipedia. I, this is my everyday uh, experience. So this is relates to what we just talked about. Comments back here. Yeah. Yell. Or come up. Can't, we can't or come up. It's not a uh, one. I have a question that this is the same kind of question. So uh, this morning uh, we had a review session. Uh, I believe they said or well, could be now.
this this to answer your question this is the part where we pimp uh Brandon's talk later one of two talks actually we'll be talking there's one talk with me and him and Howie that's specifically about features for editor participation and then he's also going to do a general principles talk It's, I think it's an interesting question because, okay, so one of our colleagues and... Uh, so English is too big, so no one can dominate. Yeah. So if we get a good leader and dominate, then people yeah. can... Uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting because one of our colleagues, Mariana, wrote a history of the Russian Wikipedia for the foundation, and there was actually that kind of, you can see it in the trends too, there's like a early growth spike, and then it kind of started to die, and now it's like taking off a little bit again, and that, that, that like hump happened because of a change in the community when it was very small like that. So I do think that the data shows that that's a big effect on smaller Wikipedias. But Jonathan. There's It's, it's kind of a two-parter question, I think, and Eric has maybe some comments on that too. But um, one of them you, you sort of hinted at is, is can we convert vandals? Like, is it even possible? Is to our templates the right way to do that? I think it's an kind of an open question, but I would point to the fact that, um, and this was included in the little handout Sue gave, that when we, we looked at people who are in the top 100 editors, no, top 1,000 editors of English Wikipedia by edit count, and then we measured whether their first 100 contributions were ever reverted uh, specifically for vandalism, like, you know, revert V, revert vandal, or something like that. 30% of the top 1,000 editors of Wikipedia were reverted as vandals pretty significantly in their first editing history, which I think is kind of interesting. And then the other, the other part of the question is, is are we just getting more efficient at reverting vandals? Like, is this is this interesting? So one thing that's, I think, interesting to note in this is that the actual number of messages like sent through these tools is pretty steady at this point. It's hard to see because this is a stacked graph. I should show it to you in a different format. Um, but on the other hand, when you measure vandal fighting actions by experienced editors, the number of people who are doing that since 2007 has dropped pretty dramatically as well. Like the proportion of people who do vandal fighting is a significant part of their work as like their core part of uh, the community. Perhaps. But we also know through some of the coding, the manual coding of edits that Stephen and others have done, uh, what the actual percentage of vandalism is uh, over time. And we know that the same edits 
that in 2004, 2005 would have been the foundation of a developing article will in 2011 get a speedy deletion template and a warning message on the user talk page and no welcoming, no expression of appreciation. Like just as a, a small anecdote, when I tested the Wikilove feature and looked at, at a few uh, edits where I could express appreciation, I uh, went through new pages and like one of the first pages that came up was the article about a newly elected uh, Egyptian prime minister. And the person who had created that article was probably a user in Egypt uh, who wanted to document an important event in their country. No welcoming message. Speedy deletion on the article. Tagging of, of the user. Like that's the current response mechanisms uh, that the community has evolved over the last few years to deal with what has been a very real percentage-wise increase in vandalism, but which catches in its crossfire every single new person who is trying to make a good faith contribution. And that, we know, is a major, major deterrent of new users. Yeah, so, uh, you mentioned deletion, and one of the interesting statistics to come out of, we, term, we measured deletion overall in English Wikipedia. So 51% of deletions in English Wikipedia are speedy deletions. And the number one category of speedy deletion is A7, which is notability. Uh, it's like 36, 38% of, of all deletion in that category. So, yeah, Sydney. We don't know those exact numbers yet. We have some proportion stuff, like whether they were auto-confirmed or that kind of thing. Um, but I don't have firm numbers for you right now. We are studying it, so. Merrick. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it's important to distinguish between vandalism and speedy deletion, for example, notability. And the templates should be separate. Because what happens at the moment, for a speedy deletion, you might get a template. But, it, but it's counted as a level one warning, which then a level two vandalism warning could go to it. So those two things should be separate. Yeah. And I can give you a simple answer to the question for vandalism with Huggle. And Cluebot has got excellent now. I started off vandalism, uh, vandal handling about 2008. And Cluebot is so fast now, unless it's, <laughs> unless it's very subtle vandalism, any dodgy word will go within 0.1 of a second. Yeah. So Basically, and I think that's a good thing because I'd rather get a template from a bot than from a person. Really? Yes. I don't know. I'd rather get talked to by a human. <laughs> if you, why, why would you want to keep people who are just disrupting the... Well, the, the like you said, you have to separate out. So we're going to take this offline. Yeah, we should. So we're going to move on to the next talk. Uh, I just want to say, um, really, I think this is the beginning of a conversation. And I think really important, our teams are working hard on to understand these dynamics. But I think the solution set is largely in the community. And any solutions that come up, whether they be software or social solutions, really would benefit dramatically from people like you and others really engaging on what are the issues, what do we understand them, and how do we f create solutions that really solve the problems and don't create all sorts of uh, unintended consequences. So I'd urge you to find ways to engage on this issue. And you go look at the research. The research is going to be all over the place. Comment on the research. Start conversations on this on this subject because I think that's how we start to generate it. It's the old story. There will not be one silver bullet. It's going to be, you know, a hundred one percent solutions. And I think most of those solutions have to come out of the community, be developed, improved, changed, uh, iterated as we go forward. So hope, hopefully, this is the beginning of a good, long uh, conversation. And then obviously something that starts to reverse the trends that we're seeing. So thank you very much, and we're going to turn it over to Eric. Um, hello, my name is Eric Sachter. I work as data analyst for the foundation. I'm um, uh, mainly going to uh, show you some output from a recent visualization, which I extended over the weeks. Uh, but I have some introductory slides. Um, like this. So. This is actually an animation from three, four years ago, and I'll very briefly show it to you to make a point. So
So what you see here is for every Wikipedia, over time, the x-axis is time, it's growing in number of articles, which is the i-axis, and in size of community, the number of editors, that's the diameter of the circle, and in maturity of content, which is the color. The main point here is, for the moment, it's a very optimistic animation. Everything is growing, and we were happy to see it, but we have a more nuanced, uh, we need a more nuanced approach these days. So then a year ago, uh, two years ago, one year after that animation, this was uh, a way to show people that we are really successful, but more in some languages than in others. You see here the, in, in blue ch uh, bars, you see the, the different uh, languages, the uh, largest language, uh, most left. Uh, it also counts uh, secondary language speakers, so that makes English first above Chinese. And then in red bars, you see the number of editors per million speakers. And it's cl very obvious that in some Wikipedias there's much more participation than in others. So that was a first attempt to show that we really have a lot to do yet. This is mainly to show you that um, while these are uh, y useful, uh, d d y it's useful to have a lot of uh, charts and data, uh, tables and bar charts, it's not very obvious at a glance what it tells you. So pictures tell uh, much more, in, in v much more concise. These are two charts from Wikipedia, the uh, distribution of population in the world and internet penetration. And it's at a glance obvious that those two completely mismatch. So this chart is from external chart from, from I took from the web, again, to show you how more powerful visualizations can be. It's a bit dated already, but you can at the, you can very quickly see that over only six years, um, the Chinese uh, internet population outgrew the largest one up then up till then. We could actually, and I hope we'll find time to do it, um, update this chart with our own data and perhaps from the World Bank and even make an animation out of it. Yet another one, briefly. This is a, a prediction by Forrester, which shows how internet is really exploding and more in Asia than anywhere else. So now I'm coming to my main topic. Like I said, I wanted to do more visualization and to uh, plot um, edits and reads on a world map. I chose the what they generically call the equirectangular projection, which is very common on the web. It's also used by Google in some, um, not sure in that. It's, it's definitely used by NASA because I took this chart from their site. Um, I'm going to show you data that we uh, gathered through our uh, logs, our squid logs, where every uh, request to our servers is being uh, is lending, and we keep one in thousand of page views, and we keep all edits for a, for a couple of months. And I thought to to plot those on a map, and for several reasons, the uh, coordinates have been rounded. One of them is uh, privacy, so you cannot really pinpoint to a certain specific location, and also to give more. Um, to get better average numbers to show. Um, by rounding to half degrees, uh, longitude, latitude and longitude, actually you have a different um, clustering size uh, depending on uh, are you close to the equator or the, the pole, but that's kind of an issue that almost always happens with maps, which are not, uh, like the Peters projection, are not um, Equi surface project projections. So I'll start with some edits. And incidentally, um, this picture tells you that it's much more easy to edit now than 100 years ago. So that we are the at the right time. Here you see this. Th this has been published uh, a few months ago already. Here you see distribution of edits to the English Wikipedia from 
all over the world. For many languages, it was really obvious where most edits would come from. And for English, it wasn't so much. Of course, there are uh, countries with a lot of editors we could all think of, but how many come from India, for example? And this gives you some impression. Here's another example. If you look at the Portuguese Wikipedia, it, this tells you at a glance that it's edited much more from Brazil than from Portugal, which is oh, not that strange, of course. There's so many more people. Oh, that's the end button. How did I, why did I put it? So one more example, the Chinese Wikipedia. Um, th this seemingly tells you that few edits are done by the Chinese mainland and that almost everything is coming from uh, Taiwan and Hong Kong. But some people commented that perhaps they use uh, proxies. That might be true and that is that we don't detect yet. But I'm not sure why they would use proxies from other Chinese countries. They might use proxies from all over the world. So I'm not sure how much that can uh, uh, would change the, 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 the picture. Last one about edits. This is the distribution of edits for all languages together. And well, it's quite obvious that most edits are coming from Europe. Um, and there's a good explanation for that, of course. Uh, there are so many different languages in Europe that whenever a major uh, event occurs, you'll see it being uh, described on 20 different language Wikipedias. So more about reads, which is new data, which I haven't published yet. This is a heat map. It shows you for all Wikipedias together, for all page views from one day, from where they came. And the color in the heat map shows you how many came from a certain location, uh, a, a quadrant with a half degree, rounded to a half degree, like I said. So it's all together about half a billion page views each day. I have a few detailed slides, slides so that you can see it better. Wikipedia is mostly edited from certain parts of the US. It probably correlates highly to demographics, but we have no, no real data on that yet. Well, again, the distribution over Europe is um, un quite uneven, and it's clear that some countries are more into Wikipedia than others. And here a third one. And of course, Japan and is is highly. It's it's also the second language, the second uh, Wikipedia in size. This is another one. Here I um, make a distinction between views coming from desktops and mobile devices. And I'll show some detailed maps again. But first, I want to explain something. If you look carefully, you see that the total share of mobile is 14.4%, which is more than we ever expected. And I'll explain that on the chart. We've been um, counting the percentage mobile uh, for uh, quite a long time already. And there are different ways to, 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 to different definitions you that you can use. The um, first one we, um, th the most obvious one is, and what, what most people uh, think of if you, if you talk about m mobile traffic, is traffic going to our mobile site, uh, which is probably mostly from mobile devices, but it should not, it ha doesn't have to be. Some people with a uh, very slow connection might uh, find out that even from a desktop it could be useful to go to the mobile site. Um, next to that we count the number of requests coming from, from mobile devices to anywhere. It might be to our mobile site, but it might be to our main site as well. That's the red line. 
those two lines we've been tracking for a while now, but then preparing this uh, talk, it occurred to me that these are really apples and oranges because the, they are, uh, the data are derived from completely different uh, sources. The blue line, the, the traffic to the mobile site is from uh, the, the aggregated stats that uh, Domas Mitusas publishes, and the red line is counting all server requests, which is much more images than pages and, and, and script files and so on. So I thought to, to, to equalize those, and I changed some of the reports to, to give both metrics. And now you can also see the number of requests from mobile to anywhere for only pages, for only HTML files. And that is quite a, a higher figure, which is not so unsurprising, really, because some applications on, the, uh, on, on a mobile device will only give you what you ask for and not all 30 images from a page. So that skews the proportion. And I thought to balance it by, on by also asking page requests only. So that's about the 15%. It might be a bit high because it's summertime. I also put up a review needed because I at first I was not quite sure if, I if we factored in everything. We have been talking about double counts for a while, du double counts for a while but uh, so I'm asking, we'll ask some colleagues to look at it, but I'm 90% sure that this is dependable. So again, uh, ba back to the page views for mobile. Here you see that uh, the, the, the distribution is quite uneven over even uh, 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 the United States. There is much more, a higher proportion of mobile coming from the central US than from the coasts. I'm not sure, but might that have to do with uh, landlines which are not always available in, in the center. Again, here in Europe, you see quite an even distribution, and I wouldn't know why, but UK is really much more mobilized mobile than other parts of Western Europe. And here, Japan stands out, of course, and Korea as well. Um, there is some noise in it, so some of the data would improve if we have a higher sampling rate. I hope we can do that in the future. So what we could do to extend even further on this would be to correlate it with demographics. And it would be nice if we could find demographic data which is the same uh, uh, granularity, I'm not sure, but I've seen charts, I'm not sure if those data are open. And like I said, we could animate the monthly trends, for example, using uh, the API, the World Bank API, they have a huge collection of data and a nice API and we could get all kinds of data on a yearly and sometimes monthly basis and, co uh, and put that in. So in the time that I got left, I'll give you beef, a brief introduction in the... in the animation. It's the data have been loading, it's now building some tables. It takes a while if you uh, request this from, uh, from a, a server, this is local data because it's, these are huge data sets. First, uh, the, the you are asked whether you like one presentation of edits better than the other one. Uh, but you can always change later, so I'll choose for the, the bubbles now. And every bubble you see is one edit. Over a day there are 400,000 edits, and if you take your time, you can see them all one by one coming on this animation. You can speed it up, it's now sp speeded up five times, but you can speed it up a bit more. Um, there's a l uh, uh, some options I'm not going to show you all. 
Um, but I'll show you that we have different charts. Uh, this is the animation by itself. Uh, you can zoom in, which you already saw happening. So this gives you a better overview, and the most active area is again Europe. Then you can see the, the bubbles, like I already showed you. And if you cycle through different languages, with, for example, the spacebar, you get a nice overview per language. Um, this same data you can see as a heat map. So the more bright the color, the more activity is going on. It's a bit dark on the, on the, on, on the projector screen. I'm sorry for that. And then, this is what I just showed you, the, the, the page views per, per, uh, per, per location. The black, black grid that you see is an artifact, it doesn't mean anything. And the ratio in mobile. Um, I think there is more to find out, but you were, uh, it, th there is some explanation uh, on the website and you probably b can find it by trial and error. So that's my talk. It's on the stats.wikimedia.org. Stats um, I have a, a blog and uh, that points you to it, but I'll put up a reference on the stats page itself. That would be very difficult because we detect vandalism uh, edits from the dumps where you can see all the, the history uh, for a certain article with comments, why changes were made and so on. Uh, we can uh, compare revisions. Um, so that's a completely different source. Um, um, nothing is impossible, but it would be difficult. Sorry? Yes, but not 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 that kind of data is not in our squid logs. It's no more questions. Thank you very much. So no, no worries, according to the plan, there's still five minutes to go. <laughs> um, this talk will be about the Wikipedia Editor Satisfaction Survey. This presentation will be about the Wikipedia Editor Satisfaction Survey. And you might wonder, why another editor survey? Because we just heard about one. And indeed, my presentation will be um, tackling some of the same problems that we already heard of. But this survey has a different focus. First, the sample is a different one. The survey focuses on the German uh, Wikipedia project, but there's also a sample of the English Wikipedia as a comparison group. And of course, the survey itself also has a different focus, although it tries to find out something about the same um, things in the end. So it has the same goals. My presentation um, will start with, um, with some information about the survey, some information about the banner that we have used for the survey, and I'll give you first impressions on the survey. Um, there might not be enough time for a discussion, so please um, feel free to pop up with questions if you have them. So let's start with the survey. Our key partners in um, doing the survey were Wikimedia Germany, the Wikimedia Foundation, Ilmenau University of Technology, and of course, the Wikipedia community. I would like to use this opportunity to thank all the people that have made this um, survey possible. First of all, um, Eric, like many of them are here actually, so um, Alulita, Nimes, Rohan, Pavel, Dennis, 
um, where's Will, where's Will Checker? I saw you <laughs> down there. And of course, all the dedicated testers within the community and also uh, the participants of the survey. So what were the research goals? The main research goal was to give a differentiated perspective on the German and English Wikipedia communities with a focus on deficits in motivation and satisfaction. Why did I do this? I did uh, try to identify the causes of decline in community growth, both fo focusing on new and existing users. That means users, uh, that means causes of user burnout and also causes of early user dropout. And last not least, the development of measures for Wikipedia's community health as an input to Wikimedia Germany's um, strategy building, but also as an input to other initiatives such as uh, the Wikimedia Foundation's usability initiative. So let me get into more detail um, with the main research question, let's say. Um, let's start um, from the end. What about satisfaction? Why is satisfaction so important? Wouldn't it be enough if users would just contribute, if they were committed? Why is this other dimension, the satisfaction, so important? In fact, we want users not only to be committed, but al also to be satisfied with their commitment. Because if they're not, they might, might just burn out. And in fact, um, the pilot study so this study showed that high commitment usually leads to a higher proportion of unpleasant activities. As you can imagine if you are uh, a high contributor. But what is even more important maybe in this context is um, what happens in a low user commitment scenario with low user satisfaction. What could that be? Well, it could be new users that try to um, write an article, for example. And uh, one user here, Brian Alafer, she uh, gave a presentation about her first article. And it was not such a pleasant um, journey for her. She collected all the uh, requests for deletion, speedy deletion, etc. And new users usually have to go through this. And this, this barrier actually is increasing. And the danger of this of course it leads to low user satisfaction, is that new users will drop out immediately. The second very important dimension is motivation, and we have heard about motivation, um, uh, let's say, in um, even today, uh, in Professor uh, Beckler's speech. When we think about um, the motivation to contribute to Wikipedia, these are, in fact, two um, German, well-known German uh, Wikipedians. Um, when we think about the motiv motivation to contribute to Wikipedia, to an encyclopedia, we usually think um, about the editors and um, about people um, that have certain hobbies and that like to write. And of course, this is a great incentive to contribute to Wikipedia if you like the work you're doing there. But what we mustn't forget, and that's why I really loved um, the presentation we heard um, from uh, Professor Benkler, is the social component. These editors, if they contribute a lot, they are um, interwebbed in, in a community that also gives huge incentives, social incentives, gratifications to them. And again, in the, in the pilot study, to this study, um, I found out that social gratifications um, are an even better predictor for high workload, for high commitment in users than are the, grati the, the activity gratifications themselves. So really don't forget the social component. Wikipedia is really highly social and that's what um, I think does the trick. But we'll see more uh, about that uh, in the, well, in the, fur in the further um, analysis of the study. So what about the differentiated perspective? I used the term user and editor before, but what I really meant is homogeneous types of editors. You see, things are a little more complicated, and I'll try to illustrate this um, now. When we think about editors, we think about people who write articles. But you can also spell check. 
In Wikipedia, you can also revise existing articles or categorize them. You can animate, you can take photos, you can be an, ad an, an, an administrator and delete the work of others. <laughs> you can discuss, you can troll, you can um, even like meet up with other people, find friends there, you can flirt, uh, you can patrol, you can be that part of the vandal fighting efforts. You can do so many things within Wikipedia. And this doesn't really, this is not all of it. There's endless pos possibilities in Wikipedia and to be useful for Wikipedia. So, um, but what that also means is that of course, there are many, many different types of users that do different things, that are motivated by different things. And that is also a very important perspective that we um, have to deal with if, if we do um, research on Wikipedia. Wikipedia, or Wikipedians, that's, it's just not one homogeneous group, it's many different uh, groups. So before I come to the first uh, impressions um, on the survey, let me just um, give you a brief introduction to the, into the banner that we use for sampling. The sampling goals were, we wanted to, I wanted to um, sample active editors only. I wanted to, in contrast to the study that we've um, just heard of, uh, sample logged in and anonymous editors at the same time. I wanted to do uh, sustainable sampling. That, in other words, I, I didn't want to burn the ground for um, other research that is following. And um, it should be a very in unintrusive way of sampling. So how did we accomplish this? Accomplish this? We used the central notice um, banner that existed and um, created, um, I made it only display after the first edit of a day. Like when a user first um, edits Wikipedia, then he'll see the banner, but only for 15 minutes. So how will, how will this work? A user will click on edit, make his edit, and only after he finishes his work, he'll see the banner up there. So this way, the workflow of a user is not disrupted. And another thing uh, I, we implemented uh, was random sampling. Um, this was not done in the, in the German Wikipedia. We, we sampled every active user there. But uh, in the English Wikipedia, we only sampled one out of 10 active editors. And of course, uh, the banner and the banner code is, uh, is open source, so please feel free to use it for your own research. So now to the first impressions. And here it says sampling finished only a few days ago. Yeah, that's true. Like the sampling uh, period I was talking about was just um, like ended last week. So I don't really have first results, although I know that uh, the, the heading sounds like first results. It is in fact not. It is just first impressions that I can give you based on raw data only and just as a quick and dirty approach to the data. So it, I just tried out some things to give you a first impression. The sampling period was from 12th to 26th of July. I got about um, 2,100 valid responses, 1,600 of them from German Wikipedia and about 500 of them from English Wikipedia. Here you see the age um, distribution, and um, you see that a mean doesn't really um, give justice to uh, what is actually happening, because the mean would be about um, 30 years old. But you see uh, that here's actually a gap if you compare it to the normal distribution. In fact, in this um, period of time where, where users, um, my suggestion would be start to, uh, to work and have um, many things to deal with um, besides dealing with Wikipedia, um, the usage and the contribution um, declines, whereas uh, before that we have a, a much higher um, frequency of con contributing. We've all heard, already heard about the 9% um, of female editors um, th that we have, uh, so really Wikipedia right now is just male dominated with all of the negative consequences that has, so I will put um, much effort into uh, finding out where the problem might be and in fact how to, to tackle it, how to change things here. If you look at access levels within the sample, 70% um, uh, of the users were logged in. 
and 29% of the users were anonymous, so not logged in. But you've ha if you have a closer look at these 30% of anonymous users, you see that more than half of them actually do have a user account, but we're just not using it at that particular moment in time. Only a little less than half of them were actually um, users that did not have a user accounts. I'll call them IPs. And as I know that, um, well, in sum, this, gi this gives us um, about 80% of users within the sample, 13% of IPs, and 6% of admins, just to describe you the sample. And as I know that um, in the, like, the last survey um, we've heard, um, of IP users were not included. Um, I'll try to give you some, um, some, some idea of um, who these IP users are. This is education levels compared um, IP user and admins. And as you see, um, education levels rise uh, from IP to user to admins. So that, that means that Wikipedia is attracting a certain group of people, um, well-educated people in that sense. Of course, this doesn't, um, this shouldn't tell you, okay, um, IPs are less educated uh, than are the other groups, so let's just uh, not care about them. This would be a completely wrong uh, idea to get. Um, all of the users and all of the admins were IP users before. And in fact, if you compare the, um, the, the, the total figures, um, IP users are the, the doctoral um, IP users are, much, are a, big, a much bigger group than are, for example, uh, the admins within Wikipedia. If you compare the world the workload between groups, um, there's not much surprise here. IP users don't com contribute that much, uh, usually less than day, one day per week. Admins, however, um, contribute much more than, uh, much more likely about um, six days per week or so. And in fact, IP users do the less interesting work. Um, I won't get, because of time constraints, I won't get into this um, in detail, but it basically says that um, the, the, the tasks that IP users do are much simpler, um, whereas the, the tasks that administrators do uh, is much more complex and needs uh, much more um, education and uh, knowledge to do them. And um, admins also um, identify more with the work they do. So they, in the end, they have the feeling that what they contributed um, to the project is something they contributed. So um, they did something substantial there. Whereas IP users do not have that feeling. So how does that reflect on satisfaction? This is just the general um, satisfaction in a sum. You see, although the groups differ a bit, um, <coughs> they don't differ that much. That means that the differences um, within the groups, let's say within IP users and within admins, um, are much larger than are um, the difference between those groups. So it will be very interesting to um, have a more detailed look at those groups and see uh, which IP users, what type of, of IP users are really unsatisfied and which IP users are more satisfied. Same goes with uh, users and admins. The ranking of usability um, is also um, interesting. Um, IP users, let's say, of course, uh, didn't um, agree on Wikipedia's usability so much. Um, users did more, and admins, the, the admin rating uh, is lower than the user rating, which means that if you do highly complicated, uh, highly complex tasks within, um, uh, with uh, the Wikipedia syntax, um, which more advanced users like admins will do, um, there's also problems here. But I think these problems are the problems that we have to tackle first. The highest um, difference in uh, my tryout um, for this uh, presentation only uh, was the perceived appreciation for the work. Admins usually feel that their work is appreciated by the community. IP users are not so sure. So if you want to encourage um, the, the commitment of new users, of IP users, Wikilove is a really good um, starting point, um, but it doesn't um, reach IP users, I think. So, um, but these users have to be reached. 
let's say, um, only by, um, by motivating them before they, uh, they contribute. Right now, um, when you try to contribute as an IP user, you see many warnings uh, that, that suggest to you uh, maybe, mm, maybe what I want to contribute is not really that well sourced and maybe, hmm, well, I'll skip that. So, um, I'll, of course, I'll go into more detail here. This is just very general, um, this is a, just a very general approach comparing IP uh, user and administrators. Um, but we'll, what we'll see is much more um, detail here. So for the outlook, um, this is what you can expect. I'll try to find out if there are, in fact, these homogeneous groups of users within the community that I was um, telling you about. I'll try to find um, solutions on how to uh, improve editor satisfaction, and I'll try to find um, solutions on how to improve editor commitment. And you, I'm sure you'll hear more about this um, in Wikimedia, or at least I hope. Um, I'll try to, um, to get a presentation there um, to give you uh, more information about uh, the analysis. Um, if you want to find out more about this before Wikimania 2012, just visit wikipediaresearch.org. There'll be more information about that, um, about uh, proceedings <coughs> just as they proceed. And last not least, you can subscribe to the newsletter. I've brought some um, sheets with me where you can, where you can write your um, email address if you want to be um, informed as soon um, as there are new um, informations on this survey. So at this point, I thank you very much um, for listening to me. I hope um, that um, it was interesting for you. And usually, the discussion would follow. And feel free to ask me any questions you like. Uh, but sure, you can also um, have the break if you want. So thank you very much.